number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame. Ding ding ding, shame. You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative. Very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being canceled on social media? Let me know. At number nine, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number eight, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon. Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink, and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then, it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider, or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank God we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number seven, no pleasure. The Dark Ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe, they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then, any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one-way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number six, soccer. These days, people regard soccer or football as a modern European sport, and though it is popular in these modern times, it turns out that the sport has been around a lot longer than you might think. Soccer was first played back in the Dark Ages, however, it is very different from the soccer that we know today. Back then, the sport didn't even really have a name, and there were no rules either. The only thing that people followed when playing the game was the objective of winning. Back then, you were allowed to win by any means necessary, besides deliberately offing people, of course. 
Back then, soccer became known as a pretty brutal sport. It was violent, chaotic, bloody, and sometimes even deadly. It involved an infinite amount of players, so it was really a free for all on the playing field. The sport was so intense that in 1314, King Edward II banned the game, decreeing, quote, on pain of imprisonment, such games to be used in the cities in future, end quote. Glad things have changed since then because FIFA would be really intense if it hadn't. At number five, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person, you know? Since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. 
According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that your wine-colored pee is a bad thing. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week. So many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. 
Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. 
The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this, how many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands' or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. At number 10, fashion. Back in the Dark Ages, fashion and high quality clothing were a symbol of status in society. For the elite, it was their way of displaying their wealth and high status over the poorer population. Because this meant so much to them, obviously they had to go above and beyond with their looks and oh boy oh boy, did they take things to a whole new level. Everything was super exaggerated. For women, they just wore the finest dresses, but for men, that's where things got spicy. Male fashion was quite something. They would often wear dangerously short tunics with tights and belts to really snatch their waist, followed by the codpiece to really accentuate things down under, you know? But their shoes. Don't even get me started on their shoes. They wore some seriously pointy shoes, and to them, the longer and pointier, the better. Their elf looking kicks were really what screamed, I'm better than you, to the rest of the public. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with whalebone to keep their shape. These people looked pretty ridiculous, at least to our modern standards, but back then, wearing pointy shoes and tunics with the codpiece was like the equivalent to wearing a full Gucci fit. At number 9, helmeted chickens. In the Dark Ages, peasants didn't really get the best food. The good stuff was more so saved for the members of the elite, and these people ate some good stuff. I mean, to us it's weird, but to them, it was finger licking good. Speaking of finger licking good though, let me tell you about one of their weirdest foods, helmeted chicken. No, it wasn't a special chicken that was prepared with special ingredients or whatever. It was literally what the name is, a helmeted chicken, aka a chicken with a helmet on. I know, weird, right? This was a theatrical dish to say the least. It featured a regular old cooked chicken that was stitched to a pig like he was riding on its back, and to add a special little something something, the cooks would fashion a tiny helmet to make it look like a guard or knight for whatever lord or king that they were serving this bizarre dish to. This was a fan favorite because of how extravagant it was, but that trend sort of lived and died in the dark ages because you can't catch any chef doing something like that these days. Gordon Ramsay would have a fit over this one. Before I carry on telling you guys about all of the weird and crazy things that people did back in the dark ages, I would first like to ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also consider subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number eight, beautiful death. Death was kind of a big deal in the dark ages. Sounds weird, but you also have to take into account the fact that the average life expectancy was only about 30 years old, so really, you didn't have long. Also, people back then were faced with some pretty harsh times like famine, cold, and of course, the Black Death. Because they had to face death so early on and so often, the so-called art of dying came to be. The whole premise behind the art of dying revolved around dying a good Christian death. 
According to those who lived in the Dark Ages, your death had to be planned and peaceful. When someone was on their deathbed, they would concern themselves with accepting their fate without quote, despair, disbelief, impatience, pride, or avarice. End quote. This art of dying thing was very popular amongst priests, and this actually led to a lot of painters at the time depicting people in holy professions as submissive to death and what was to come for them. At number seven, Feast of Fools. One of the more lively aspects of the Dark Ages was the many festivals and holidays that were celebrated. Though most of the population worked grueling hours for days on end, they often got breaks to hold celebrations. Most holidays and celebrations that were held were religious, but others were just silly and were designed for people to have fun, like the Feast of Fools for example. The Feast of Fools was held in early January and was inspired by the pagan festival of Saturnalia. This was a pretty interesting festival because it involved swapping the highest respected officials with serving maids and they became masters and were crowned kings of misrule. This festival first started as something confined to the church, but soon became a bigger affair with parades, comic performances, music, costumes, and even drag. These people really liked their festivals. Another pretty weird festival that they held was the Festival of the Ass, where a young girl carrying a child would ride on the back of a donkey into a church and during the service, instead of saying amen, they would say hee haw like a donkey. I know, bizarre, right? At number six, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read, or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube? Huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun, the cemetery. Yep, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately, they're not corpse husband, although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up, thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. At number five, weddings. Marriage and weddings back in the dark ages were very different than they are today. Back then, because the average life expectancy was so low, people started getting married and having kids very young. Usually, girls would be married off as soon as they hit puberty, around the age of 12, and these marriages were not for love. Arranged marriages were the norm back then because it was mostly used to join families for status or for alliances. Marriage ceremonies were also very different back then. Because marriages just weren't as big of a deal back then as they are today, it didn't matter where you got married or how soon. Most people didn't need permission to get married so they could hold the ceremony 